How the Terrible Dungeon Master Can't Improv at All A game I was in recently dissolved, and the parts of the group who got along elsewhere reformed. We're something like 85% through Rise of the Rune Lords, but I just couldn't take the DM's sheer lack of investment, effort, and storytelling anymore. As a preface, this is not some newbie DM who's doing the best they can with very little experience. This person has been running games for more than a decade, and has run large swaths of this specific adventure path at least four times in the past. I was involved in one of them, and it was beat for beat, line for line exactly the same, despite a wildly different group of PCs and players alike. But I'm getting ahead of myself. When this campaign started, I wanted to do something unique that would tie into the themes of the adventure. Being big damn heroes, fighting evil wizards been on world domination, all that. So I opted to put together a paladin. I got permission to play an Ozimar and went for the version of that race that can pass for human. Then I took it a step further and gave him a literal red right hand. The son of a noted crusader in a theocracy half a world away, he was chased out of town one step ahead of a witch hunt because his right hand started changing as he hit puberty. Now it's a black nailed red scaled monstrosity that he keeps concealed beneath a gauntlet. Said gauntlet has gone black and grown vicious thorny spikes just from its constant exposure to this corruption. This was done as a deliberate attempt to mirror the villain of the first book of the campaign, a piece of meta knowledge I had and discussed with the DM beforehand. The villain is an Ozimar who's purposefully trying to corrupt herself through the worship of an evil goddess and her left hand and arm are twisted and demonic. The idea was that thematically, if he could save her, then maybe there was hope that he could save himself from whatever this curse, affliction, etc. is. The entirety of the first book is just painting by the numbers. I didn't notice it first because I figured it was just my familiarity with this stretch of the game. But the paladin and his party fight to protect the town, only kill enemies when they have to, and they capture a majority of the named NPC bad guys to bring back to the sheriff. We get no cooperation or RP out of them when we try to interrogate them, but sure, whatever. Then comes the fight with the first book boss. Not only is she overpowered in a fairly epic duel of light versus dark, good versus evil, but the paladin manages to take her alive. He has her bound and stabilized, ready to take back to town, when out of nowhere an explosion of teeth and tentacles devour her right out of his arms. I've checked with other players, this isn't part of the module. That was when I started noticing other things, like how NPCs would only ever deliver lines that were written in the book, or be characters you could interact with if it was specifically written in this book of the module, that they had a role to play. If you tried to find them and interact with them other than during those periods, you got curt responses, if you could even find them at all. And once we handed bad guys over to the law, they just vanished into a black hole. Couldn't talk to them, never found out what happened to them. They were out of sight and out of mind. Nothing else was written about them in the book, and it was too much to ask the DM to roleplay with us after they'd had their screen time, apparently. It was several years of campaign, but all is some of the things that I felt were big red flags that should have made me leave a lot earlier than I did. Getting visibly pissy when we wouldn't interact with haunts. For those who don't know, a haunt is basically a ghost-based trap that usually requires a will save and does bad things to you. They also tend to be pretty obvious. Room full of blood stains, moaning, visible ghostly entities, etc. If there was nothing we needed in that room, we shut the door and kept walking, instead of putting our foot in the bear trap. Constantly bitching about how OP we were, yet refusing to change any aspect of the pre-written combats to reflect who was actually across the table from her. Pre-written battles aren't perfect, but if you have a one versus many fight with an evil anything when the party head is a paladin, don't be surprised when it gets its face pushed in. I suggested everything from changing the shape of the arena, giving the bad guys more room to maneuver so he couldn't just gang up on them, to adding bodyguards and minions. In my opinion, the best strategy for increasing challenge, without risking too big of a total party kill threat, but it was consistently ignored. No changes would be made, but the complaining would remain. Regularly forgetting or getting mad about party abilities. I've lost count of the number of times this DM would try to force a fear check and glare at me when I reminded them my PC was immune to fear and had been for more than a year and a half out of game. As to specific things, there were three big incidents that I feel finally put a stake through my patience and willingness to see it through to the end with this DM at the helm other than the one big story cock block already mentioned above. The first, my paladin literally walked away from his faith at level 5. His archetype traded in spells and his alignment maintained. So his other class features stayed in place, which was the whole reason I entertained the idea of turning his back on his god, since having a deity at all was more for flavor and background than actual mechanical need. I didn't do this subtly either. I made a big song and dance of it, as he buried a man he'd been forced to kill to protect others, who was being driven mad by ghoul fever. He tore off the holy symbol he'd worn since childhood and threw it in the grave with the man, telling him he'd get more use out of it, symbolically burying his faith along with the man. The DM had zero reaction, and when asked about it later, claimed they hadn't noticed I didn't remember, despite me drawing the whole table's attention to it, and bringing it up in later emails I sent. The second, 
I'd originally left big gaps in the character's ancestry and history for the DM to fill in and play with to time closer to the game. When it became clear that wasn't going to happen, around level 11 to 12, I filled them in myself. The character had gained infernal bloodline sorcerer powers through a particular feat tree, a touch that could leave one shaken, and the ability to summon hellfire, and he'd taken the Ozimar feats to grant him steel skin, wings, and a blast of blinding sunlight. But for flavor, I'd been saying that he can transform these features. The steel layer is beneath his normal skin, a la Terminator. His wings manifest only when he wishes, etc. The DM shrugged and made no objection, and around this point I found a portrait of the archfiend Belial. This creature is half angel, half demon, and given that my paladin's corruption had been spreading, when he was full-on in fighting form, he looked like a smaller version of this archfiend. Belial was also a natural shapeshifter, playing right into the flavorful mutations and regressions my paladin had been displaying. The idea at this point was that his bloodline is so potent because it goes back to one of the major powers of hell, and no one ever told him, if they ever knew. I wrote up a whole dream sequence deal about the powers of hell becoming aware of him, and laid it out specifically to give my DM a chance to tempt him. In this case, I spelled it out, offer him belonging, a home where he'd be valued and wanted, free from judgment, and where his place was assured. That would have been a serious temptation for someone driven into exile, always leaving town before people can find out about his demon claw. The arc directly after this incident was going into a parallel dimension filled with evil wizards. Evil wizards who could have taken one look at him and thought, what the hell is a servant of Belial doing here? What does it want? But that discussion was never had. None of these evil wizards so much as tried to address this glowing, steel-skinned, one angel wing and one devil wing herald of destruction. Even when he tried to speak to them, they just flung a spell at him. For the record, none of those fights lasted very long, because that PC may as well have been built to slay evil wizards. Which was why I sort of handed the DM a way to make them social encounters, as we weren't there to kill these wizards. We were there to acquire a particular weapon. We could have just taken it and gone, leaving them in peace if they had been willing to actually talk to us. The one that really stuck with me in this section, and that left me staring at the DM going, are you serious? That's what she does? Was the encounter with the succubus. Belial is the Lord of Lust, and with an intelligence of 18 and being an extra planar creature, this wizard would recognize at a glance where the paladin's bloodline comes from. But rather than offering hospitality, thereby binding the party to the laws of being good guests, or at least putting them on their back foot, or offering to tell him more about his great sire, when he looks confused as to what she's talking about, and the title she's addressing him by, she reaches for a whip and goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. The enchantress succubus, who can feel the combined auras of good and lust emanating from the warrior of the holy light, took one look at him and thought, yeah, I'll hit that guy with my whip, that'll work out well for me. She was dead in one turn, as was any trust this DM had built up with me over the years. Third, the final straw. At this point, I just wanted to finish the campaign. Scorched earth, salt the ground, walk away and not play under this DM again. But the incident right after all of these wizard fights was the straw that broke my camel's back. We were in the wild northern mountains and heard the cry of a wendigo. Me, the player, knows that's a high CR monster. My character knows Jack and is simply told it's a powerful evil spirit of cannibalism in the north. My character soloed a demon one CR below his level about a month ago and didn't even get hit before blasting it back to hell. He then proceeded to beat the brakes off the lich who'd summoned said demon in a mid-air smash fest that looked like the cover of a meatloaf album. Being told, there's an undead creature looking to start shit, it is met with a sigh and an equivalent of sure, why not, I'll pencil him in later. We then proceed to walk through a haunted mining camp, blasting through every save we were asked for, and once again ignoring the haunts that are so obvious it's comical. The DM starts getting actively snippy with us for not taking this seriously, at which point I asked what the last DC was. It was about a 17. Not only was I immune to fear, and granting the party plus four bonuses just for being near me, but that save had gotten crushed by everyone there. No, we're not afraid of this. We've spent this entire campaign fighting armies of ghouls, staring into the eyes of demons, and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with evil wizards of legend. Getting scared about ghostly moanings nearly 30-year-old bloodstains is stupid at this point. And expecting us to act afraid when we have no reason to be is ridiculous. Were the player's expectations too high for the DM, or was the DM half-assing it? I'm sure for every great DM out there, there are 10 bad ones. Please tell us of your experiences and comment your reactions below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel All Things D&D. Our next video will be posted in two days, so stay tuned for more amazing Dungeons & Dragons content.